It appears states are increasingly relying upon non-military tools, such as trade embargoes, to enforce their interests. Is this, then, the future of interstate conflict in the 21st century? The ability to hold trade hostage to political objectives suggests the emerging East Asian economic and political order may be one of antagonistic prosperity. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this panel. My name is John Swenson Wright uh, from Cambridge University and also from Chatham House. Uh, in light of Kurt Campbell's remarks this morning, I'm happy to say I'm one of the underrepresented European participants in the conference. Um, we are today going to look at the issue of the relationship between um, uh, economic issues, trade disputes, and security. And I'm sure those of you who are students of international relations will need no reminding of the a uh, famous book from the 1920s, authored by um, Angel, entitled The Grand Illusion, which suggested, controversially, that economic engagement between states should be a, a force for good uh, as a means of ameliorating regional tensions. We've seen, I would argue, in recent uh, months, uh, the opposite uh, outcome, and we've seen trade disputes, of course, between China and Japan, um, dividing adversaries and intensifying bilateral relations. We've seen with the closing or suspension of the Kaesong Industrial Complex the way in which economic power can be used to advance political objectives. And of course, we see between um, friends, between allies also, the sense in which economic issues also complicate bilateral relations, perhaps most strikingly in terms of the relationship between South Korea and Japan. It's the absence of close economic cooperation that I think highlights the importance of this topic. But also, if we take a more optimistic point of view, we could consider the extent to which economic interaction between states provides opportunities for reducing tensions. And of course, perhaps most powerfully of all, in light of recent crises in the region where North Korea is concerned, there's been a lot of talk about the importance of economic engagement as a means of opening the state to greater international contact. And particularly in light of the official language coming out of Pyongyang, suggesting that the North Korean government under its new leader might be minded to embrace some of these issues. I'm sure that's a topic also we're going to want to look at in the course of our discussions. We have three key guiding questions. Um, one, how likely are we to see more of those um, attempts to use economic punishment as a means of advancing political objectives? Two, at what point do the traditional division between economics and politics that we associate with some states, perhaps most strikingly Japan, uh, begin to disappear? What was the motivating forces domestically and internationally that perhaps prompted that change? And third, and perhaps this is most important in the context of the DPRK, can joint investment projects and regional economic initiatives mitigate some of those tensions? We've got a very distinguished panel of individuals with a long history of expertise in looking at just that relationship. To my left, Kent Calder, who is currently director of the Reichshauer Center at Seist Johns Hopkins, my own alma mater, part of the Seist Mafia that was introduced this morning, um, who's written extensively on alliance diplomacy, on American basing strategy, and in his earlier work on the critical importance of energy in East Asia. So he's clearly very well briefed and very well prepared to talk about this topic. To his left, TJ Pemple, who is the Jack Forsey Professor of Political Science at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, who previously taught at the University of Washington at Seattle and at Cornell University, the University of Colorado and the University of Wisconsin. Many of you will know his work that looked at domestic and international political changes that affected Japan uh, and the political economy of Japan. And once again, it's that uh, understanding of the relationship between those two issues that I think means that we will have somebody who can talk to us very meaningfully about these key issues. And to his left, Soya Yoshihide, um, who is a professor at the Faculty of Law at Keio University, uh, has made a, a great deal of impact in terms of the discussion of East Asian diplomacy by coining the term of middle power diplomacy to talk about Japan's approach to uh, regional and global affairs. And of course, again, Japan is perhaps most uh, critically important in this discussion because of its long history of, in a sense, separating economics from political issues, at least in many of its key bilateral relationships. Obviously, with the advent of the Abe government, that's a, a change that we're now seeing with 
a much more assertive posture in terms of its military and political approach to the region and further afield. Last but not least, at the very end, Dr. Igor Tomberg, who is the director of the Center for Energy and Transport Research at the Institute of Oriental Studies at the Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, he's written extensively on energy issues as they affect China um, and many articles and books dealing with global energy problems as a whole. So we have an expert panel. I'm going to ask them each to speak initially for about five minutes and then we're going to open up to discussion amongst the panel and there'll be time at the end for questions from the floor. So without further ado, I'll turn over to Kent. Thank you very much, John. It's a, a delight to be here and I'm glad it's still relatively early in the morning. Uh, it, we're, we've got a time difference here and later in the evening is a lot harder for us, of course, with jet lag. Um, I guess to, to start with, as John had mentioned, um, I've done a fair amount of work on energy. And energy, I think, is an interesting way of point of departure for thinking about uh, the issue of um, relationship of security and economics and embargoes and the strategic use of economic tools. Um, as he has said, as John has just said, we see these, we've seen these dramatically recently uh, in things like the rare metals embargo uh, that uh, China imposed, uh, some of the d dealings between North Korea and, and uh, South Korea, as well as sanctions and embargoes. Um, and one of the first points that I would make is certainly recently uh, th there's been some intensification of the use of economic tools uh, f uh, for secure as a tool of security policy. But this is by no means new. If we went back to the 1930s, of course, embargoes, and go back to the 17th century throughout modern economic history, and uh, perhaps uh, before the uh, 18th century, before the emergence of free trade in the 19th century, even more than recently, mercantilism, the use of the economy as a tool of national interest and politics, of course, was very common. Um, even as recently as 1972, of course, even in the United States, uh, which, it, and we, have, of course, have stressed, uh, uh, generally speaking, that we forego those sorts of tools, but the soybean embargo, for example, uh, by the Nixon administration about J against Japan, the suspension of the convertibility of the dollar. Um, economic tools have been used you know, quite broadly, not just recently, but there's a much longer history. So um, I think some sense of the historical is important here. My sense is even more than recently, if you look at the 1970s, uh, the era of the oil shocks, the era of OPEC, uh, the era of the Yom Kippur War and the embargo against Israel, of course those uh, weapons were very, very common in that period. Um, Will they, uh, what sort of a dynamic do we have now and what is it really that impels these and in particularly in East Asia? Uh, are these likely to become uh, more common tools and is trade and finance uh, going to become more politicized? I think it to some extent uh, depends upon the sector and also upon the, on the country. As a, a generalization, I think energy is a, sec a sector which can be, a, tends to be uh, prone to politicization and in the, in the case of East Asia, of course, the major nations of Northeast Asia in particular um, are vulnerable because they have such heavy uh, dependence on uh, international markets. So um, energy is a sector that, uh, where there's some possibility of this sort of thing occurring. Um, information technology, because of the uh, pervasiveness, its central role in economies, also the lack of international standards. I know there's a separate session on uh, cyber, cyber warfare. It does seem to me that information technology, cyber warfare, this is a sector where we could very easily, in fact, we perhaps are seeing the the glimmerings of that already emerging, where we're going to see uh, this sort of thing. Um, I think the general lesson 
of the cases that we've seen recently in East Asia is that its, it's uh, use of economic warfare is tempting, but that it tends to be relatively ineffective. Uh, I think cyber warfare or possibly some variations of financial warfare uh, could be a partial exception to that. Um, but I think the uh, rare metals case is a, is a case in point. It was tempting uh, for China. Uh, Japan was 80% dependent for its rare metal imports on China. Um, but in the three years since 2010, when these issues began to emerge, Japan, Japanese reliance on China has fallen from 80 to 50 percent. Um, Japan has diversified. Japan has, to some extent, stockpiled. Um, Japan has economized in its use of the materials. It's gone to new countries, to Kazakhstan, to Mongolia, uh, has cooperated with the United States. And so, um, attempts to use uh, this kind of economic warfare don't only undermine trust, but they also promote uh, countermeasures or uh, uh, diversification. And in a global world, those sort of things tend to be uh, relatively effective. And I think um, that, the, the ability for countermeasures, and then the implications of losing suppliers um, will mean, will, will inhibit the use of economic warfare. Um, we don't have any Chinese participants on this panel, and as a Japan specialist, of course, I'm very sensitive to the importance of these issues for Japan and Korea, and uh, I think that China, it was counterproductive for China itself to have engaged in the rare metals uh, embargo. So the question arises really, and certainly from hindsight particularly, as to why they did it, uh, in that it does appear uh, in retrospect to have been counterproductive. I think uh, one has to also look at domestic factors and the way they relate to economic warfare, to two-level games or even multiple-level uh, games in political science ter terminology. Um, in the case of China, Specifically, uh, you had a very large number of producers uh, who were competing with one another to move to the export market. The export prices under which China was exporting rare metals went down and down and down. If you want a strategic uh, explanation, well, they drove the other producers out. But also there was very low profitability and a lot of uh, competition and my understanding is that there was also some frustration on the Chinese regulatory governmental side that uh, the, the, the individual firms were engaging in uh, what appeared to be a, uh, a, a counterproductive shift in the terms of trade away from themselves. So I think in understanding the rare metals case, this isn't only a matter of a strategic decision at the national level. Um, there are also local or um, international dynamics that drive this sort of thing. Um, you could, in the uh, um, soybean embargo of 1972 in the United States, I think as well, uh, there, was a, uh, there were those political dynamics. And again, in um, hindsight, it appears fairly clear that they didn't work. So at least uh, to be a devil's advocate, I'm, I'll be one that suggests that these things are going to be the eco economic tools outside of cyber warfare and outside of finance uh, will likely be relatively limited. Um, I should just say a word about finance because there, I think, uh, uh, one can see uh, the possibility of uh, finance as an economic tool uh, becoming significant in future. The, in, the case that I think is instructive is the, um, the uh, 1996 uh, crisis, the missile crisis in Taiwan. It wa whether this was intentional or not, I don't know. But um, the effect of the missile tests, of course, there was no one killed, there was no physical damage. These are just tests in the vicinity of some of Taiwan's shipping lanes. But they did have sharp effects short-term on financial markets. Financial markets are extremely sensitive to demonstration effects of various kinds. And um, as in the case of the information industry, it seems 
to me that those are areas where at relatively little cost one can extract uh, uh, benefits, uh, can, one can signal in ways that may have uh, implications for the future. Um, just finally, I don't know whether you, do we consider the three questions together or do you, you can just want to look like at the one? Yeah, just well, uh, just very briefly, in terms of uh, the breakdown of Seike Bunri, as the Japanese put it, or the, the differentiation of uh, politics and, and finance, um, I guess I see that as uh, a casualty in a way of, of some broader um, uh, political uh, issues such as the, the territorial issue and um, as, a, as a form of signaling. I don't think Japan from its side um, has been uh, trying to break down uh, that, that barrier so much as um, other countries in using embargoes, the case of, of China and, um, and the rare metals, I think, is a case in point, have been uh, trying to use particular leverage that they have to break down um, that barrier. Um, with regarding cooperation, the third of the issues, just to uh, put something on the table, um, it does seem to me that potentially um, um, economic cooperation can have an inhibiting uh, effect. Uh, particularly, it depends on the, how it's structured. I think it's instructive, for example, to look, and uh, Mr. Tomberg, no doubt, would go into these. I don't want to preempt what he would say. But it seems to me that the, co the contrast between Sakhalin 1, uh, 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 energy research pro source project in Sakhalin, and Sakhalin 2 is rather interesting. Sahalin II was a uh, more or less an entirely private sector uh, project, Mitsubishi and Mitsui, and now Gazprom as well, which uh, has received a uh, has a, a majority stake in that venture. Was ultimately after the investment was largely done, was taken over uh, by the Russians. Um, whereas uh, Sahalin I, uh, the original structure that included Sodeco, some, some governmental role, and as well as private companies actually has, has been preserved. And, you know, why there are some cases where uh, a durable structure without political intervention continues, and whereas there are others where it doesn't, I think is uh, inst instructive and something that we ought to look at. Okay, thank you, Ken. TJ. Thanks. Uh, let me add my uh, thanks to those of earlier voices to Asan for the opportunity to be here and for putting together such an interesting forum. Uh, let me start by saying I think that as we look at post-Cold War Asia <clears throat> in the sphere of economics generally, four trends sort of jump out at me as particularly salient. Uh, the first of these is simply the incredible economic growth that has engulfed most of East Asia. Virtually all of the political leadership by the 1980s and certainly by the 1990s of all of the countries within the region essentially shifted their, uh, the basis for their legitimation to economic growth and providing economic benefits to their citizenry. The two most conspicuous exceptions, of course, are North Korea and uh, Burma or Myanmar. You could make a case for Cambodia and Laos being on the margins as well, but uh, for the most part, the rest of Asia has moved forward uh, with embrace of economic growth. A second big trend, it strikes to me, is that this economic growth has been fostered by and has been part and parcel of a growing wave of foreign direct investment across the region, the development of regional production networks, and increasingly the formalization of free trade pacts, whether minilateral or bilateral, that most of the countries of the region that have been economically successful have also bought into. Still a third point or a third trend that I see across the region is that there has been an increasing institutionalization of the economic linkages among these various countries. ASEAN plus three is one of these uh, important links. Uh, the Chiang Mai Initiative, now Chiang Mai Initiative Multilateralization, uh, Asian bond markets, uh, the East Asia Summit, uh, 
uh, in Kent's book with Min Yi, uh, he has a list of, I think, 20 some odd formal institutions that just Northeast Asian uh, governments participate in. So the point of this is simply to say there has been far more government to government cooperation across the region, particularly on economic issues, much less so on security issues, but that has been part and parcel of this broader trend toward greater economic uh, interaction. And finally, it seems to me, as a play out of this, there's been a decline in the use of military force across the region that I think is important for us to keep in mind because as we talk about uh, global disorder, uh, the voices of the pessimists uh, can very easily take uh, prominence when in fact it's important to recognize that within Asia as a whole, there's been no serious military conflict since 1979 with Vietnam, China. <clears throat> And in Northeast Asia, we've had peace since the Korean armistice ended the conflict in 1953. That all being said, and that being the sort of positive spin on this, I think it's important to recognize, though, that particularly in the short run, and particularly since roughly 2010, we've seen the increase in the number of security tensions that have begun to bedevil uh, this particular part of the world. Part of this, I think, has been a reassertion, if you want, or a new assertiveness on the part of China, particularly with the rather bizarre uh, articulation of the so-called nine-dash line and the increasing escalation of what China now claims to be its core interests. Most recently, three or four days ago, the foreign ministry declaring that the Senkaku Daoyu Islands are part of a core interest in China the first time, to my knowledge, that's been officially articulated. So that's certainly one element that has triggered uh, some of these difficulties and disputes. A second one, unmistakably, is the absence, uh, the, the assertiveness of North Korea, the nuclear program of North Korea, the missile testing of the North, and the fact that North Korea has essentially absented itself from participation in the regional economic and regional production networks uh, the North does not get its legitimacy, the leaders of the North do not get their legitimacy by providing greater benefits to a growing middle class in North Korea, as we obviously are very familiar with. Uh, still a third problem, I think, across the region in terms of security tensions has been the rise of nationalism, particularly as this has taken place within Japan, to some extent also, I think, in South Korea. It plays out in that difficulty that South Korea and Japan have in cooperating with each other on political issues. It plays out in issues of history, comfort women, uh, the perception that the Abe regime is now a re-articulator of a new nationalism, a new right-wing uh, speech uh, uh, articulation within uh, the area, etc. Uh, and there are still elements of nationalist competition within parts of Southeast Asia that play out in Cambodia, Thai disputes, uh, Malaysia, Thai disputes, etc. Uh, the Philippines and uh, uh, Manila, uh, Philippines and Malaysia, most recently with the uh, in Sabah, etc. So uh, clearly all of these issues play out in the form of some version of coercive diplomacy. Uh, we have not seen a creation of a security community across East Asia, and uh, there have been a whole series of security disputes, particularly since 2010. Uh, I mentioned three causes of this, and I think it's fair, only, uh, only fair as an American to say the Obama pivot to Asia has also, I think, triggered a great deal of concern and dispute, particularly on the part of China, about how this is all going to play out and whether this is really a subterfuge for containment. One of the points that I would like to stress, though, is that the security tensions that have played out in the last several years within the region have not been the result of economic disputes. They are essentially political disputes in which periodically economics are used as a weapon of political articulation or political comp competition, but we don't have replays of the kinds of disputes that took place between the United States and Japan, for example, over soybeans mentioned earlier, textiles, automobiles, uh, semiconductors, etc. Uh, we have periodic issues of mushrooms uh, 
being exported, et cetera, et cetera. But for the most part, economic tensions within the region, economic disputes within the region have a regularized procedure through the WTO through which they play out. So for the most part, I think what we're seeing is a situation in which the, 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 politi the, the drivers of tension are essentially political drivers rather than economic drivers. That all being said, I think there's one other area, though, within this economic and trade dispute configuration that needs to be underscored, and that is the growing competition, if you want, among three competing packs of uh, patterns of trade agreement. We have TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, on the one hand, uh, which would put together the United States uh, and 11 other countries, most recently including uh, Japan and also Canada. But uh, secondly, we have the possibilities of a trilateral pact among Japan, China, and South Korea. Negotiations have begun for this pact. There is already in place a free trade, I'm sorry, a, an agreement on foreign investment among these three countries. So the ball is rolling on cooperation in trade among Japan, China, and South Korea. And certainly that would be an articulation of a very deeply embedded economic interdependence. And then we also have the uh, RCEP program uh, proposal, which would be uh, one that would include all of Southeast Asia, uh, would not include the United States, etc. And it seems to me there are implicit security dimensions to each of these three pacts. On the one hand, China, Japan, Korea would, I think, serve a great deal... Pardon? China, Japan, Korea would play a, a great role in terms of articulating the economic interdependence among those three and work toward the possibility of reducing security tensions and political tensions. I think Japan in particular, and to a lesser extent the ROK, is very interested in TPP, even though Korea is not now a participant, but this would very deeply engage the United States economically in the Asia Pacific in ways that go beyond simply the military presence that was articulated with regard to the pivot. And RCEP would be a very easy to accomplish trade pact because it would not require a great deal of internal transformation on the part of countries like China or like Japan that have been very resistant and whose politics are still very heavily dependent on great elements of protection. So it seems to me that for the most part the economic picture is a, a generally good one across the region uh, and that there is now the opportunity to deepen some of the economic interdependence in a more formal way through these trade pacts, but I think there's going to be a kind of political competition among the three trade pacts that are now on the table, and it will remain to be seen how those play out. Let me stop on that, John. Great. Thank you, TJ. Um, Yoshihide. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, I, I would also like to follow the previous speakers in thanking uh, Asan Institute for uh, inviting me. Uh, to, to this uh, plenum. Uh, I'm, I'm very lucky guy, perhaps. I've been attending all the previous ones. And, uh, and I, I, all the time, I'm pre this, this plenum is given a, one of the top priorities. And, uh, well, uh, because the time is very much limited, let me get into the subject uh, directly. Uh, let me, uh, uh, first of all, lay out uh, some, some macro trends and then move on to the particular theme of this session, and, and finally on perhaps Japan, which I cannot escape uh, uh, in, in this panel. Uh, and as, as a major theme cutting uh, all, uh, through all these dimensions, uh, I think is that today we are, we are living in an age where uh, full of, full of you know, dichotomies or dilemmas or inconsistencies, however you, you name it. And uh, as perhaps Step Stefan Krasner implied uh, in this morning's keynote speech, uh, there is no easy way out, uh, out of these, uh, you know, these inconsistencies. Uh, but the trend would, would not necessarily be you know, ominous uh, in, in, into the future. Uh, but so uh, we'll continue to live in a very uncertain uh, period of transition for, for a long time, perhaps. And the one negative side of this uh, uh, it should be, you know, people tend to get frustrated, uh, largely because there is no easy solution. 
and uh, secondly, because uh, issues are so complicated. And, uh, and as a result of people getting frustrated, I think that has a lot to do with you know, the importance of domestic politics uh, in, uh, in uh, extending foreign policies and, 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 uh, and in interchanging with, with external countries. I think that, that, that is a very general phenomenon. Uh, at this time. And uh, one uh, macro trend that I like to point out, which is, is not new, of course, everybody knows it. Uh, one big difference when, when we talk about possible Sino-American confrontation in coming years, one big difference from the time of the Cold War is that in the dimension of security, there may be some, some sources and reasons of concerns, but economic realities are totally different from the Cold War period. We are all dependent on China, and China is depended on the you know, international system of uh, so-called liberal international order. And, uh, and so security and the economic uh, trade uh, aspects, I think there are, there are I think, uh, inconsistencies uh, in, in, in some ways, but uh, both, both, uh, both are the realities. And secondly, the rise of China also entails similar sort of dichotomy. Uh, that is, as a result of China becoming confident about its power, and the, the, the voices coming from China are requesting sort of so-called fair treatment or having Chinese voices in the manage, management of existing international regimes and, and the processes, and they are getting bigger, naturally, naturally. Uh, but so, so China could be regarded as a challenger to some of the dimensions of existing international uh, regimes. But at the same time, today's success of China is indeed a result of China living with those you know, systems and regimes, uh, which, is basically, which are basically creations of uh, you know, advanced democracies such as Europe, US, and Japan joined the group later. So, 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 so the, the implications of the rise of China are those two, at least those two you know, trends, uh, do not necessarily you know, converge uh, and will, will remain, I think, a dichotomous in one way or another, but uh, we have to live with them. Uh, for, for many years to come. And uh, so, so thirdly, about this uh, the theme of this session, economic sanctions and uh, the relationship implications for security or vice versa, uh, uh, I think already uh, central points were, were, were mentioned. Uh, for instance, the, the use of rare earth export to Japan at the time of uh, territory dispute, uh, 2010. Uh, uh, of course, Chinese purpose was political. Uh, intention was to change uh, Japanese behaviors. And, uh, but its, its impact, economic impacts, uh, of course, it's very, very much uncertain. And uh, th this, this might work against Chinese economic interests, but this could also uh, give some negative impact upon the global international system uh, as a whole. So implications of using economic means for political purposes uh, could, could be very different today compared to the previous years. You know, interdependence is, of course, a universal phenomenon for many years, but at the time of this globalization, I think the nature of interdependence has, has, has changed uh, substantially, uh, affecting the global <coughs> system uh, first and foremost uh, instantly. So, so I think uh, the, the, these, these uh, two, two sides of use of economic means for political purposes <coughs> Uh, could, will continue to complicate uh, our life and our, our diplomacy and external relations uh, for, for, again, for many years to come. And, but uh, there is a second type of use of, I think, economic means for political purposes. That is to show political will or to, to show the kind of, you know, your resolve in responding or reacting to some, some difficult issues with, with your foreign counterparts. Uh, which does not necessarily entail the purpose of you know, changing uh, you know, the other's behaviors, but just as, a, as an act of showing your frustration or opposition and so forth. So there could be those two, broadly speaking, two types of two different types of maybe economic, use of economic means for political purposes. But uh, uh, of course, what is, what is more worrisome is the first, first type, which is the use of economic means uh, with the intention or purpose to, to change uh, behaviors of, of your counterparts. And, uh, and lastly, about, about Japan, and particularly in the context of Sino-Japanese relations. 
Uh, I personally and many, many, uh, I'm sure, should have very much mixed feelings uh, about uh, recent uh, developments uh, because uh, in, in this context of, you know, uh, the, the, uh, you know economic and security uh, sort of uh, nexus. Uh, well, when uh, Mr. Dan Xiaoping started its very courageous uh, open door and reform uh, policies in the late 1970s, Japan was naturally the first country which Mr. Dan Xiaoping uh, looked to for, for two major inputs. Uh, one is of foreign uh, ODA, official development assistance, and second is of, uh, direct foreign investment. And uh, so it's, it's very much symbolic that Mr. Dan, when he visited Japan, uh, met uh, Matsushita Konosuke, the founder of Panasonic, and asked Matsushita personally to help his, his policies and invest in China. And uh, so after that, uh, I think Japan's major purpose of China policy was to help the Chinese, the Dan Xiaoping's projects. And with the, if, with the uh, political uh, purpose, which government uh, formally said, you know, economic development of China is very important for Chinese social stability as well as political stability. And political stability of China is important for uh, stability of Sino-Japanese relations and by extension, East Asian you know, international relations. And uh, this was just more than a slogan. I think that was, uh, that was it when Japan started to give massive ODA to China and the Japanese businesses are getting into Chinese market and uh, without expecting any immediate profits in initial years. And uh, so that's how Sino -Japanese, new uh, Sino-Japanese relationships started uh, at the turn of the 70s and into, into the 80s. And uh, so it's, it's really sad uh, to see what we saw uh, in the Chinese people's demonstrations and the sort of destructive actions against you know, those Japanese kind of, kind of, you know, investments and so forth. But, but that's, that's how things turned out. And, uh, and as a result, uh, I think uh, something, some, I think this was implied again by the chairman and uh, Kent Calder also mentioned uh, this, uh, that is Japan's somewhat emphasis on its foreign policy, yes, has shifted. Uh, previously, uh, Japan was very, very much reluctant in talking about political security dimension of East, A East Asian affairs in general, as well as Japanese external policies. And uh, so, so helping China modernize was very much important. And uh, because it's Korea, Japan was, I think, very much important in Korean modernization. Uh, many Koreans forgot about it now, but uh, and that, that was the history. But that, that, was, that, that was what Japanese diplomacy was, was almost all about. And we are very much reluctant in talking about for instance, democracy. And uh, our, our slogan was, economic development should come first, and then democratization would follow. That's, that's what Asia is. And, uh, but somehow, from some time in the 90s, that, that uh, juxtaposition of you know, uh, economy and uh, democratization, economic development and democratization, has somehow changed. Now our government is talking about value diplomacy. They are talking of values first, and, and you know, and as, so how and why that happened? Uh, if, if I'm giving my, my one hour, I, I can talk, but uh, this is not the time to do so. But so that shift is real, yes. Uh, but but I think uh, that's that's uh, largely because of the <coughs> difficulty of living in this uh, you know age of uh, complexity, and uh, and I think it's it's a sign of somewhat maladjustment of Japanese diplomacy to this you know, dichotomous evolution of many complex issues. And uh, hopefully, Abe phenomena could be, could be transitional uh, from, as Japan was moving from one time to, to another. And, uh, but uh, this transitional period will remain very much uncertain and complicated, just like uh, the global you know, uh, evolution of, of global affairs will remain uh, complex and, and complicated. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Tomberg. <coughs> I think I don't have too much time, so maybe telegraphic. Well, a very fine example when we discussed uh, China's hold of the rare earth minerals export to Japan because uh, we are talking about resources. And uh, we all know that resources all the time were and will be the main reason of 
not only trade dispute, but sometimes conflicts. And it's very actual for uh, East Asia, because East Asia is uh, the world's major consumer of energy. And, and uh, uh, in nowadays situation, when uh, we meet all these uh, disputes around territorial problems around islands, all this uh, uh, supply chains and supply uh, um, tra tra transportation co connections might be very easily cut. And uh, I think that uh, if we speak about energy security and uh, energy cooperation in East Asia, we should find some other solutions. For example, uh, we should uh, shift to more and more shift to mainland or land com communication and uh, land uh, transportation lanes. Uh, especially it's uh, serious for energy resources because energy, you know, it's the uh, main basic of uh, any stable and uh, stable development. And uh, for example, we have Russia, we have uh, Mongolia, we have Central Asia no problems with sea communications and uh, plenty of, uh, of resources. And uh, getting back to the uh, theme of our session, I pay attention to guiding question number three, which sounds, can joint investment project and regional economic initiatives uh, mitigate some of these animosities? Animosities we already named several times, and uh, I think that uh, interesting projects certainly can uh, solve a lot of problems and uh, uh, how to say, and uh, mitigate uh, very m m many problems uh, in political sphere as well. <coughs> Very good example, which I mentioned last time in, the, in this <laughs> in Korea, it's a project of Trans-Korean gas pipeline. Very interesting project N nowadays. Maybe it sounds not very realistic, but time changes, and uh, now it's more or less ready, and that now it's most feasible of the project uh, of gas supply from Russia to East Asia countries. Feasibility study is ready and confirmed. And uh, <clears throat> all three countries have benefits from this project. I don't have time to mention, to name all this, but it's understandable. And uh, I think that um, Russia now is initiator of bilateral negotiations, is negotiating with South Korea, with North Korea, and Russia even uh, mm, wrote out debt of uh, North Korea to Soviet Union last year, preparing uh, soil for normal project, for normal communication. And uh, to finish with, I think that uh, Northeast Asia is a region where naturally cooperation in energy sector is uh, absolutely possible and absolutely synergic. And, uh, but this potential is far from effective now. Great, thank you very much. Um, you've all presented in some ways with varying degrees, I think, of um, subtlety, a fairly optimistic assessment of the role that economics plays in alleviating or compensating for some of these tensions. And I think there are kind of two key questions that immediately emerge from the presentations. Um, picking up on Kent's point about the importance of non-state actors and linking it also to TJ's uh, useful summary of the different institutional developments we've seen in recent years, is a question of to what extent are those institutions fit for purpose? Are they adequate to address the economic needs of the states in the region? And who are the driving actors in shaping this closer economic integration? Is it the state principally? Or is it non-state actors or local governments? One thinks of the case of Japan and its relations with Russia, for example. And a second question, in a sense, which I think comes out of our discussion, which in some ways is striking because it hasn't been mentioned, or a second issue, is the role of ideology. 
If we think back 10 or 20 years ago with the vigorous debates of the nature of the Asian economic model of development, and contrast that with the views of Western politicians. David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, said recently and rather controversially, but perhaps not so surprisingly in terms of domestic politics in the UK, we are all Thatcherites now. Mm. To what extent does that characterization of um, the absence of ideological debate fit in the Asian context? Mm. Um, and the third issue really comes back to this question of domestic politics. Um, and in a way, Sawyer's point about the importance of nationalism, not just in the case of Japan, but in other states in the region, to what extent do you think domestic political pressures are driving some of the uh, instincts on the part of ind individual state leaders to use economics as a tool to advance political agendas. Mm. So we have questions about the importance of institutions, whether there are too many of them, which ones should be at the top of our hierarchy and whether they're suited to deal with these issues and whether we need alternatives to institutions at the local level. Secondly, the question of ideology. And third, the issue of domestic politics. So if we take those three issues, and perhaps in the same order, I mm. ask you to, uh, to consider those. Mm. Ken. Well, um, I think there's no question that um, there's an organization gap. If you contrast the Northeast Asian region with other major regions of the world, of course, uh, most uh, strikingly Europe, uh, but also even Southeast Asia, you know, what's striking is the, uh, the lack of regional organizations. On the security side, of course, there's nothing analogous to NATO or the, a lot of those Cold War institutions like CETO or even ASEAN or, um, you know, that those things have not developed, partly just because of the uh, deep uh, security tensions in the region um, uh, surrounding the, of the Korean Peninsula, of course. So, no question there's a gap. As I was trying to s stress in the uh, making of Northeast Asia, I do think that some of the very tensions that have existed at the top levels, like, uh, say, Prime Minister Koizumi between uh, the controversy over his Yaskuni visits uh, and things like that, actually, at a, a lower level, began to stimulate a much deeper process that hasn't been sufficiently well analyzed of um, um, coordination at lower bureaucratic levels. There couldn't be any state visits, but ministers of finance and a lot of lower level officials actually in the last uh, decade, since the, uh, 15 years now since the Asian financial crisis, have begun to meet uh, quite actively. And so you get this lower level institutional infrastructure that's begun to evolve in summit conferences and the uh, the TCAO, the uh, Trilateral Cooperation Institution, and uh, there's a lot more than you would think, even in spite of all the territorial disputes and, uh, and historical controversies and so on, um, that the uh, private sector has certainly played an important role. Uh, ideology, I guess, on that point, I would tend to agree. Uh, I don't see too many Thatcherites in exactly that formation around East Asia. But um, th there's a good question in my mind as to how far the whole question of value, well, how the, what the values diplomacy and value debates actually amount to, or whether in the Asian context, whether that's a, a positive thing or not. No doubt it, creates, it keeps... Um, China on the defensive, from a tactical point of view, perhaps it uh, can be attractive. And certainly I don't feel that people who believe in democracy or human rights should fail to, uh, to re represent the values that they believe in. But in the Asian context, uh, of course, some of this is a double-edged sword because uh, there's a, there are various sets of values around the region and to the extent that they become salient, it seems to me it does have the potential for increasing uh, tensions within the region. And that links to the question of domestic politics. No doubt in all of the countries, those are becoming more salient in the, the uh, internet, internet age. Uh, certainly there's more interdependence and that may be the, uh, the positive factor, but at the same time, 
it, it makes management of interdependence uh, increasingly complex as well. And even though there's more institutions than there have been, there's not enough. Okay, thank you. TJ. Two or three points to, uh, to tack on to uh, Kent's opening comments on this. My own take on the institutions in, um, in East Asia is, uh, is not so much to look toward Europe as the model, but to acknowledge the possibility that Asia will have its own way about going forward with institutionalization. And right now, I'm generally positively impressed by the fact that various institutions exist with different memberships, and uh, there are overlaps here and uh, contrasts there as different organizations move to try to reconcile themselves to deal with different problems. Environmental problems are going to be different from financial problems. They're going to be different from uh, problems of pollution, and security is going to be its own issue, et cetera, et cetera. And unlike Europe, I don't think we need to uh, require membership cards uh, that are, you know, one in all-purpose membership cards in which you join one organization, and that organization then drives the entire um, regional agenda. So I think given the complexity of Asia, it's better to have more that, rather than uh, few institutions. But I do think there's uh, clearly space for deepening of these institutions, and I think that comes about only after trust. Uh, and I think that's still a commodity that's very much lacking among uh, the interactions among many of the, uh, many of the countries in the region. In terms of the ideology, I don't think, there, I don't think anybody would say that we're all Thatcherites. Uh, what I think uh, is perhaps a unifying ideology, despite the, despite the differences that one can find ideologically across Northeast and Southeast Asia, communist countries, uh, political democracies, uh, you know, monarchies here and uh, uh, authoritarian regimes there, and uh, in some cases uh, smatterings of, of religious dominance or, or ethnic dominances in Malaysia, etc. The, the, the thing that's unifying, it seems to me, is that uh, we're all Listians, that, that uh, East Asia is basically committed, all of the countries of East Asia are essentially committed to national economic development. Uh, there's absolutely, to the best of my reading, no embrace of laissez-faire capitalism in the sense that we should let the business community go happily about their own deregulated business and uh, pursue their profits at the expense of what might be broader national interests. So it seems to me within the region you have a much closer cooperation typically between national businesses, whether they be state-owned enterprises or large corporations, Chabol, uh, Kadetsu, or whatever, and uh, the national government. And I think this has been particularly confirmed in the period since the Asian financial crisis of 97-98, when I think virtually every political and economic leader across the region essentially said, no matter what our own differences are, we don't ever want to go see the IMF come in and tell us how to do things again. And so we want to create conditions that are going to free us up from the possibility of another IMF invasion, uh, et cetera. And I think you saw that with the rise in foreign reserve holdings. You saw it with the rise in the Chiang Mai Initiative, the multilateralization of Chiang Mai, creation of bond markets, the uh, increasing focus on intra-regional trade, et cetera, et cetera. So if there's, a, if there's a unifying ideological component, despite the national differences, I would say it's the focus on economic development and national development and catch-up ideology and, and the absence of a, an embrace of uh, the kind of derivative trading or uh, unregulated finance that uh, prevails in Britain or the United States. And then in terms of domestic politics, I cut my teeth as somebody who specializes in comparative politics. I think domestic politics is always going to be driving a lot of the decisions that are, that are being made in the international and foreign policy arenas. I do think the complexity, though, is one that involves domestic leaders increasingly having to take account of the fact that there is a growing economic interdependence across the region. And I think leaders, as they begin to think about what's good for them politically, domestically, will of course gravitate toward their supporters, gravitate perhaps toward nationalism, perhaps gravitate toward um, particular interest groups. But I think as a second calculation, there's always going to be that sense that I need also as a political leader to recognize that my long-term, the, the long-term economic future of my country is going to depend very heavily on 
what happens in the rest of Asia, what happens in terms of our economic development. So that's why I tend to be somewhat more po uh, positive on all of this than, um, than negative. And I think that, uh, in essence, economics within the region is pulling the countries more closely together than it is dividing them. Yoshide. Yes, uh, well, without any prejudice to, to China, uh, I, I would still like to say that the China factor is very much important in dimension of institution creation in the region, uh, how China fits in, in this effort. I think that is uh, perhaps the central, central issue at the time of the rise of China. And this should be the central issue for China itself as well. I think in many ways, China is a small universe in its own right. And so that China is now getting stronger. And so which naturally affects everybody, including this institution building. So what's the role and the place of China in you know, Asia institution? Of course, I don't have an answer. And, uh, but I think that is the most critical central point. And I think TPP, anyway, symbolizes uh, this, this uh, critical question. Uh, I don't think TPP is, is uh, anti-China uh, you know, strategy or anything like that. But uh, whether or not, uh, how China would respond to this and eventually associate itself with this TPP, I think that, that will bring this central question into relief. I mean, uh, in, in talking about the future you know, regional uh, economic institution uh, in, in the region. I have no answer, but I think uh, that is most critical. And of course, demonizing and antagonizing China is not beneficial at all. We have mm. to live with China. And, uh, and Asian countries have to think about, I think, survival strategy uh, to some extent at this time. But the ultimate purpose of that survival strategy should be to coexist with China in peaceful and pro prosperous manner. And so, so that's, that's the nature of the importance of China factor, but uh, it's, it's, it's not easy, of course. And the uh, role of ideology, uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, again, here, I think chi China is very much important. Uh, what China has in mind, for instance, in its effort to build uh, Confucian institutions uh, you know, in, in the world. And the CCTV is now getting uh, you know, everywhere. And uh, its soft power diplomacy is, is uh, in full bloom, in, in, in a way. And uh, so how that would affect in the kind of ideology dimension of Asian uh, unity and uh, Asian integration in coming years. I think that is also also very, very important. And uh, finally, domestic politics. Uh, I, I like to mention, uh, the f uh, talking about nationalism is so, so prevalent uh, today. But, I, I, uh, but in terms of the substance of what appears to be nationalism, I think uh, we have to be somewhat cautious. Uh, I would say that because, of, because I'm concerned about the discourse about Japanese nationalism. For instance, the Abe phenomena. If you just compare just sim simple facts, you know, when Abe became prime minister, of the, when he created the first Abe cabinet in 2006, and his ideology was already, of course, well known, and he talked about those, you know, kind of nationalistic agenda, and, but he didn't put them into practice for practical reasons. But the, the, but the fact was supporting rate of Abe administration uh, during those years was very low, very low. I think that's a proof that his ideology didn't affect whether or not people... That was not a factor of support or non-support of the administration in 2006. And today, I think the situation should be the same. Whether people would uh, you know, support Abe's ideology or not, that is not a factor of a high rate of support of the administration in the same way or in the opposite way that this is the case back in 2006. And... Uh, and another indication could be, I mean, Hatoyama, when he became prime minister, also received very high supporting rate in initial month, more than 70%, almost as high as uh, today's Abe. You know, so, so Japanese public, 70% supporting both Hatoyama and Abe in the similar way. I mean, that is another, I think, uh, should be proof, evidence, that these conservative things or nationalism is not really the factor behind Abe's you know, popularity of Abe. But Japanese people in general are frustrated. And Abe's style of, of being self-assertive, 
and being explicit, that style itself, I think, is a source of popularity. And that this could happen to any country, you know, today. And I think that's how domestic politics matter. The government becomes hostage to domestic politics, and of course, you know, public sentiments are very important, you know, kind of engine of uh, you know any government in in you know uh, cre creating and uh, policies and external relations. And I think one danger of this phenomena could be, if you interpret the so-called phenomena of nationalism, the rise of nationalism in other countries, I think you tend to have your own you know, kind of prejudiced views about interpreting others, just like Japanese are talking about Chinese nationalism, and just like South Koreans are talking about Japanese nationalism. You tend to define the nature of the nationalism of other countries in your own you know, preferred sort of preferred way. And, uh, and you, you, you tend to kind of deny the negative side of so-called the rise of nationalism in your own country. And that this is also a somewhat uh, kind of negative side of this age when these emotional issues as well as domestic politics becoming very much important in almost every country. Okay, Dr. Tomberg. Well, a few words about um, uh, state and private role and the doing together maybe. A small example, Russian-Chinese trade uh, negotiations on gas export. Well, we all know that uh, Gazprom is severely criticized in Russia, in uh, all levels, expert, governmental, presidential. You are losing Europe, European market, and you are not going to China. Why? But, you know, devil is always in details. And uh, how to go? First of all, territories absolutely wild, absolutely undeveloped, un underdeveloped. And uh, Gazprom cannot uh, handle these billions. The company does not have all of this. And uh, it takes, uh, first of all, you should make geological research. Second, you must develop the pro whole province, like, uh, for example, Yakutia. Then you build pipelines. Then you should uh, refine the gas, because gas is very rich with uh, uh, material, such materials like helium, like uh, other fra fractions, very, very expensive. You cannot just burn it. It's nonsense. And uh, then you should deliver it to China, and then you should have normal price. It's uh, 4,000 kilometers, for example, if you take Yakutia. And uh, who pays for all this? Because if you develop the province, you should build roads, you should build railroads, you should, you should build uh, electricity lines. It's very, very exp ex expensive measures and uh, operations. And uh, certainly Putin is uh, criticizing Mr. Miller for because he ca cannot support uh, strate strategical partnership with China with economical part uh, partnership in gas. And it's a, a little bit painful sphere. But uh, you see, it's not a, a company's problem to build a strategic partnership. It's a problem of nation. And if the state wants to build such a relationship with China, strategic partnership, it, it should nevertheless pay, as minimum, construct to, 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 to provide with uh, railroads, transportation, electricity, all this uh, side works, and uh, maybe ta taxation, also export duties, all these things should be provided from the state. And it should be partnership between state and uh, co corporations. I, gave an example of Gazprom, but we also have Rosneft, the same, almost the same situation. They all pay big duties, pay big taxes, and uh, the conditions are very difficult for them. And sometimes they work, you see, un <laughs> under the profit. <laughs> so I think we are not ready to construct such a relationship between state State is also not very solid. You know, Putin is presidential, prime minister, and minister of finance. And when we speak about duties and when we speak about uh, taxes, it's absolutely 
stone uh, how to, disagreement uh, to, to, to decrease it. So it's very dif difficult situation showing that um, we must work out measures not only between countries but also inside the countries. It's number one. And when we solve the problem inside the country, it, it will be much more easy to deal with outside world. Okay, thank you very much. We have time now for questions from the floor. At the back. And if you can um, identify yourself and the institution you represent. Well, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm Chia from China. Um, in today's uh, Financial Times, there is a piece saying that uh, it's a fallacy to say uh, trade always leads to peace, and I think, uh, I guess it's true. Uh, my question for the panel is that, uh, to what extent you think that uh, uh, trade has a positive spillover uh, to security? Or, or put it differently, uh, if other things are certain, uh, uh, to what extent uh, uh, growing trade is favorable to peace? Thank you. I would like to take Kent? Just, just one um, a brief word on that. It seems to me if we contrast the evolution of um, China's relations with the world with North Korea's, it's rather striking, of course, uh, what the evolution over time has been. Um, the deepening interdependence has produced, um, has transformed China into a stakeholder in some important ways, and uh, I think it certainly has made uh, relationships easier, just as one initial point. Would anyone else from the panel like to address that question? Me? You see it? Uh, yeah, I think in general, the impact should be positive because trade and economic uh, you know, uh, exchanges uh, just connect ourselves with each other. Mm -hmm. And But if we get closer, of course, uh, we might fight, but uh, it's like it's like uh, you know your brothers and sisters, <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. you cannot get separated. And I think that's how it should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. More questions. Yep. Yeah, right over there. The back. Yep. Hi, I'm Vicky Cheek from the uh, Tokyo Foundation. Um, so, Professor Cordy, you mentioned about the uh, rare earths. Um, dispute or issue that you said rightly I think that it was a it backfired and didn't um, create the outcome that was expected by China but I wondered if you thought that uh, uh, China appreciates the Chinese government appreciates that that kind of um, tactic doesn't work and if you think it might um, happen again because it's during that sort of period from 2010 a lot of things the Chinese government did to sort of um, being more aggressive or assertive, whichever word you prefer, kind of um, negated a lot of the soft power efforts that went that started around the sort of time of the Beijing Olympics. Um, and I think, sort of, from being in, uh, based in Tokyo, there's a perception that um, on things like the Senkaku Islands, that Japan is losing the argument when it comes to um, in international media about um, what the correct policy is. And I wondered if you think that. Chinese government appreciates that that wasn't a, a good policy and if it might do it again, what do you think? Well, um, I'm not a China specialist. I don't want to speak too long. But let me just add uh, one point. It seems to me that political transitions are an important variable in affecting territorial uh, disputes and uh, uh, a range of the disputes that we've had. And in periods when central leadership, for whatever reason, is relatively weak, often because of a, of, of a, a transition of power of some sort, that uh, th these things can intensify. My personal interpretation of a lot of these things is not so much that they're secular, but that they're cyclical in nature, and that they're, they co-vary with the uh, you know, transitions in regimes and in East, Northeast Asia in the last uh, year or so, of course, we've seen a transition in the regimes in every single country. And I think that's making things worse. And I hope not only that there's a, on the learning effect question, you know, maybe some <coughs> China specialists or Chinese participants can speak to it. I, I'm, I'm modestly pessimistic on that dimension.
uh, you've got other disputes, you know, t uh, this ch the East China Sea, and of course there's two sides in all of those things. But um, on the, the question of whether these things are evolving in a secular fashion and just getting worse, I'm mildly uh, positively impressed that there's a cyclical dimension and hopeful that uh, when uh, regimes are more uh, uh, established in power and they can begin to establish trust, as uh, Professor Pampel was suggesting, that things may uh, become easier. Just very quickly, I'd uh, just add one point on this. I think rare earths is really just one example of ways in which, at least from my perspective on the outside, China basically dissipated 10 years of excellent diplomacy from 2000 to 2010 over the last couple of years, and it seems to me that if there was any learning going on, one would see a return to a more peaceful rise, a less assertive China, but I don't see it happening, and I think what we've seen has been a relatively consistently more assertive China on a whole host of issues. There are Chinese who will defend an awful lot of those and say that we've always had this nine-dash line, or we've always, you know, Philippines gave up the territory or whatever variant that is, or NOTA's really responsible for nationalizing the Senkaku Daoyu, but I think the central point is that China <laughs> ha seems to have moved, and I would say it has to be for domestic political reasons, in ways that suggest a very different strategic calculus than was operative for the first decade of this century. Okay, there's a question in the front, and then over here. Let's take two together, actually, since we're running out of time. So first here, and then a second row. Uh, thank you, Simon Long from The Economist. I, I had two questions related to Professor Pemple's enumeration of the various regional free trade agreements uh, under discussion. The membership of some of these overlaps, TPP, RCEP, the trilateral one. To what extent is there the institutional capacity for countries to be able to pursue all these in parallel? I mean, do they, do they have any, any prospect? And secondly, it's normal in these sorts of forums to pay at least lip service to, wouldn't it be better to have a global agreement? I mean, have we completely given up hope on anything useful coming out of the WTO ministerial later this year or, or of our international services agreement or anything like that? Thank you. Okay, and let's take the next question. Lucy Williamson, BBC News. Just a very broad general question for you. Does or has North Korea's position over Gaesong changed your assessment of the leadership there? I didn't, I didn't quite hear that. Kaesong. The, the oh, Kaesong. Has it changed our perception of uh, a, a North Korea's leadership? Okay, who would like to go first? Kent? Um, just, just briefly, the uh, question of... W, you know, WTO, I think, almost self-evidently, the problems we've had to do, uh, had with uh, the Doha round, I think, global uh, capabilities in a comprehensive sort of way are declining, or that the world is becoming more complex and more diverse, and, you know, uh, the, uh, either narrow agreements, sectoral agreements, and so on, or regional uh, agreements, I think, are more the wave of the future. Um, institutional capacity to pursue all three. Um, I think th there'll be le one can be used as leverage for the others. I think oh, this is almost inevitable. I mean, it's it's a game of economic diplomacy that, with a as TJ said, with a strong geopolitical uh, dimension to it. I I think it's going to be continuing uh, for probably quite some time, and. Um, in that it's not so much a technical game as a geopolitical one. I don't think the issue is the details. It's more sort of how it, the strategy, and that shouldn't uh, take such a huge capacity to deal with. Oh, one last point. The, I think Korea and Japan are in some different capability to deal with all of this. Korea, uh, for, for, uh, fortuitously, has a... Um, integration of the trade ministry and the, the foreign ministry and in the kind of era that we're moving into with all these complex geopolitically tinged negotiations I think an integration of trade and diplomacy will turn out to be a very positive thing that will perhaps advantage Korea. I'll add my voice to uh, the WTO is going nowhere and uh, 
everything else is, is a fallback or a less than perfect solution, but I think countries that are interested in uh, freeing up their trade are, are going to move in that direction. Uh, I do think that uh, there's one point that I want to add on the, on the Korea-Japan uh, situation with regard to trade. And I think I'm, I'm quite impressed by the courageousness with which South Korea has moved to enter into a relatively comprehensive agreement with the United States, the chorus, and also with the EU. I mean, China, uh, <coughs> South Korea has put an awful lot of its domestic economics on the table for relatively free trade. That is not the case with Japan, but I think once Japan <coughs> saw the chorus, Japan had to begin thinking seriously about whether it was not going to lose a competitive leg up to South Korea in areas where they were competitive, automobiles, electronics, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this business of the capacity plays both ways. I mean, do you have enough bureaucrats to negotiate three or five free trade agreements simultaneously? Probably not unless you're China with the 1.2 billion people of whom, you know, 97% could be mobilized to negotiate with Timbuktu. But, uh, but so that is a problem. But I think that the, uh, the fact that you've got an element of competitiveness in these free trade agreements does put a lot of pressure on governments now to try to move forward uh, to open things up in ways that they might otherwise not have been prepared to do. And just very briefly on the, on the question of Kaesong, and, and I'm really out of my expertise on this, but I, I have to think that, uh, that the North Korean regime has really overextended itself on this one. I mean, I think they were hoping with a whole series of these activities with uh, the nuclear test and uh, with the missile, the threat of a, nu of a missile test and uh, the, uh, the bombastic rhetoric over the, the month that the South Koreans and the Americans were engaged in, um, in live fire mil military activities and so forth. I think they got much further ahead of themselves than they, uh, than they really would have liked to. And I think when you think about the fact that Kaesong basically delivers about 80 million or more dollars to the North Korean regime on an annual basis, if Kaesong closes down, I think that hurts the North far more than it hurts the South. And I think uh, they are, the, the morning's papers suggested that they are apoplectic about the South suddenly breaking all these agreements with the North and pulling out of Kaesong as though this was a South Korean decision. Uh, clearly it's the North that's mm -hmm. been pushing this, but I think uh, we're seeing an awful lot more squeezing of North Korea going on, and I think uh, some political leaders are going to wake up in North Korea in a couple of weeks and find out that they, uh, they may have done some very serious damage to themselves. Okay. Yoshi, then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Forget about the time. Okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm okay. So right. uh, let me, let me uh, say a few words about Kaesong. Uh, I think uh, North Korean leadership uh, has embarked on a somewhat different strategy uh, under the current leader. Uh, and the bottom line now on their part is the fact that North Korea has, has become a nuclear you know, country. I mean, that, that, that's the bottom line, I think. That, mm -hmm. The assumption is that should be accepted. And on that assumption, I think they are desperate to talk. Ultimately for survival, of course, but uh, to, to, to talk to, to, to the U.S., I think. And, uh, and so the you know, usual kind of blackmailing, I think they have gone a, a bit, bit differently, very, very extreme in many ways. But uh, in a way, kind of a kind of repetition of the old, I think, uh, tactics of, of uh, getting attractions and then the putting others, forcing others into, into you know, talk, some kind of talk. And uh, so, so going, I mean, uh, Korea as a nuclear nation, that has become a kind of absolute sort of condition on their part, so that is very different now. And things may not move, of course, as they expect, and I don't know how things could move forward. But uh, I think uh, the, this Kesson case is very much, I think, telling. In, uh, along the line of the central theme of, of this panel. I mean, ec economic tool, using economic tool may backfire, you know, uh, eventually. And so uh, verbal threats is one thing, and uh, doing what they did in Kesong could be, could be another. 
and uh, and uh, so the, the, that so that was a mistake, I think, on their part. I I, I personally believe, unless they have some readiness to <coughs> you know get back uh, to get back to talks to South Korea about reopening. Uh, but but the prospect of that, I, I'm not quite sure, given South Korean government decision uh, now. TJ, you wanted to come back? On that no, issue? no, no, no. Okay, great. And um, uh, Dr. Romberg, do you have any points that you'd like to add? Response well, to I'm not a big specialist in North Korea, but mm. I think that. Uh, the, the biggest problem is internal. Mm. Um, I think the grand, grandson is trying to uh, d make his internal PR demonstra demonstrate his braveness and his decisive. And uh, maybe he has some problems with generals. That's why he's so aggressive. But uh, he is no fool, and they are no fools at all. And uh, they have very serious economical limits, to, and they don't wait for some short and glorious victory in any war conflict. So I don't think it's serious. Uh, it's serious, but politically, military, no. Okay. Well, our hosts are telling us we're out of time. Um, we've had a very interesting discussion. I think we've had an assessment that, in a sense, demonstrates that where economic interaction is concerned, the glass is probably half full rather than half empty. Uh, there is institutional vigor in East Asia and opportunities for closer cooperation, notwithstanding the efforts periodically by states sometimes to use economic resources as a means of imposing pressure. Um, all that remains is to thank our panelists for a fascinating discussion, to thank you, the audience, for your questions. Um, the session is at an end. <laughs>